Um, so after a break of summer, we've uh, welcomed you all back to the CRP conversation series. Um, returning with our fifth session on the topic of improving air quality by enhancing river and rail. So the conversation will discuss the potential for a freight hub at Waterloo Station. It will explore the potential economic, social and environmental benefits that can be achieved by prioritising this space for rail and road fed logistics hubs. For those of you who haven't met, um, my name is Ross Phillips. Um, I'm Sustainable Transport Manager at Crossroad Partnership, and I'll be chairing today's session. So uh, if we go to the next slide, yeah, uh, perfect. So the session today will start with a quick introduction for myself about the various pieces of work that CRP has been delivering on River and Rail. Um, we've got a keynote video from the Lord uh, Henry of Richmond Hill, Chair of Network Rail, um, in introducing the Northern Freight Hub project. Um, and we've got a presentation from Sabina Taru, um, project manager at Crossroad Partnership, discussing the findings of research on the express rail ferry market and the potential economic, environmental, and social impact of a freight hub of Waterloo. So we'll then be joined by our expert panelists. We've got plenty of time for questions for a discussion on how river, rail, and road deliveries can collaborate uh, to solve air quality challenges in London. We'll then ask uh, preset questions before opening up to the audience. So we've got a few preset questions to get through. Um, as this is a hybrid event, we should yeah. make aware of some moderators and people that's useful to know. So CRP's Isadora will be moderating the chat um, at the back of the room as well online. Um, and Susanna, when we get to Q&A's, will be handing out the microphone um, between anyone that does want to ask the question. Um, there'll be some links shared by Isadora in the chat yeah. um, as well. And uh, we'll also include these in our post event follow up too. So, uh, firstly, a bit of background. So, uh, CRP, we're a partnership delivering environmental, economic, and community focused projects. And we support public, private, and voluntary organizations to address creatively challenges around air quality, transport, placemaking, and well being. So, CRP's vision is to address sustainability challenges collaboratively in London and also beyond. And as a testbed for exciting projects in towns and cities, we we'll share knowledge, evidence, and best practice for the people who live, work, and visit these places. And so, one of our major projects is Smart Screen Logistics, which is aiming to improve air quality by addressing the impact of the freight in London. So, SGL is a DEFRA funded project led by Western City Council and in collaboration with 26 project partners. The project aims to minimise the impact of freight on noise air quality, traffic and pavement space in London by making improvements across 15 London boroughs and across four business improvement districts. So SGL forms part of CRP's wider activities to improve and encourage sustainable logistics across London, including the development of rail freight and walking freight initiatives and helping to improve London's air quality by supporting CRP's vision to make London a better place to live, work and visit. So it builds on the work we've done in CRP's Clean Air Logistics for London programme. This also includes two river freight trials, including the London Light Freight River Trial, which was the daily river freight service from Dartford to Bankside Pier in central London, with the delivery of Lyrico's office supplies and Speedy Services construction equipment. Deliveries were then made from the pier by cargo bikes and electric vehicles right across London. And the trial had a huge emission savings in comparison to its road-based alternatives, with a reduction of 92% in NOx, 96% for carbon dioxide, 79% uh, for PM10, and 78% for PM2.5. So freight vehicles make up 50% of London's total vehicle miles, but emit one quarter of London's overall transport carbon emissions. And this doesn't show any sign of slowing down. So COVID exacerbated changes to shopping behaviour. So there could be as many as 1 billion parcels in London delivered by 2030. So we need to think creatively about how to reorganise London's complex logistics network. So in 2022, CRP commissioned transport consultant Steer to conduct a review of stations in Lambert and Southwark as part of the Impact on Urban Health funded Clean Air Freight programme. The report highlighted interesting findings um, that show that there could be ways that Waterloo can receive railway deliveries and these would have significant air quality emission savings. Whilst also reducing the impact of HGV driver shortages, reduced congestion, reduced inefficient HGV journeys, and much more. 
This is also partly helped by a massive, uh, massively by a large section of unutilized space at Waterloo Station that could be used as a dedicated Waterloo freight hub for both rail fed and road fed journeys. And given the context of the local area, CRP are continuing to share emerging themes around the Waterloo Freight Hub with the Waterloo Station Master Plan Steering Group, who are developing plans for the future of Waterloo and will be finalise, finalising this over the coming months. So, firstly, please do go ahead after this and read our On Track for Sustainable Logistics report. Um, that's the one shown on the screen as well, that's from last year um, as well. And um, inside further. Um, so, in addition to this, we have local peers such as London Eye and Festival Pier, as well as St George's Wharf. This also presents an interesting intersection of potential inbound and outbound freight into London at Waterloo, much of which might not be that visible to residents and visitors due to the area because of the in the area because of the networks that they would take place in on the river and through rail. And with this, there's also a huge potential for impacting lots of London and their freight deliveries. So inner and central London has 3.5 million people and 220,000 businesses, and many will be receiving deliveries frequently. And the five kilometre radius that's shown on the map is also sort of designed to show and purposefully been selected because it's a sort of easily attainable distance that cargo by careers can operate from from a central London, central London freight hub. So I'll now sort of virtually pass over to a video of Peter, Lord Henry of Richmond Hill, um, Chair of Central Rail and Deputy Chair of the Great British Railways Transitions Team, who will provide a short keynote speech introducing the Waterloo Freight Hub. So I'm Peter, Lord Henry of Richmond Hill. I'm the Chair of Network Rail, and I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, uh, but I have a video contribution which I hope will be interesting for you to listen to. In London, up to 4,000 people a year suffer premature deaths because of poor air quality. As with many cities across the UK, there's a clear need to support innovative interventions to improve the environment and the air we breathe. Network Rail and the Great British Railways Transition Team, GBRTT for short, are working with Cross River Partnership to develop the Undercroft space in Waterloo Station as an innovative freight hub for zero emission last mile deliveries across London. The freight hub is a space for couriers and delivery companies to use, receive, sort and send parcels on their way to their final destination. Deliveries may come inbound by rail or road, then delivered out of the space by cargo bikes, walking trolleys, or electric vans. This will improve air quality in the local area as more residents and businesses receive their parcels by zero time point emission delivery methods. Rail freight is at the heart of Network Rail's commitments to environmental sustainability across the United Kingdom. The rail network is unique in being able to transport huge loads of goods at a fraction of the cost of road transport, particularly into dense urban areas where vital railway station infrastructure is at the heart of our cities, including London. Research from the Cross River Partnership and Steers on track for sustainable logistics report has shown that two long distance dedicated rail freight services per day could remove 8,300 lorries on the roads a year, leading to a saving of 4,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide and reducing emissions by 91% compared with road. Currently, just 1% of all the freight on the rail network is from express freight, which are parcels of items and goods that need to be transported at short notice, likely by a courier and delivery stations. These consolidated zero emission last mile deliveries can have a significant positive effect on local air quality and congestion as polluting vans are replaced by smaller zero emission vehicles like cargo bikes. The impact across London deliveries from the very centrally located Waterloo could reach up to 3.5 million people and 200,000 businesses in and of London. With the e commerce, commerce market booming, there could be up to a billion parcels delivered each year by 2030 in London. This freight pipe would prioritise much needed space for logistics and would be an important strategic lever for green growth around Waterloo, Lambeth, and across London. This Waterloo freight pipe uh, proposal is complemented by other efforts to effect transformation in the Waterloo area, with work collaboratively being shared with Waterloo Master Plan Steering Group 
and the land of Borough Council that is exploring the future of Waterloo Station in the surrounding area. Network Rail and GBRTT are supportive of this initiative and are keen to see initial road fed and rail fed trials happen at Waterloo Station Freight Hub. These trials will ensure that both Network Rail and GBRTT are taking an evidence based approach to delivering environmental sustainability projects and ensuring that we share best practice from this innovative project across London. Thank you. So, um, yeah, thanks to Peter and to Peter's team for helping us with this and putting a sort of great summary out there for the project. Um, I'll now pass over to Sabrina Toru, our project manager at Cluster of Partnership. Um, this is where we've discussed the findings of research on the express rail flow market and the potential um, environmental and social impact of the real smooth flow line. Hello everyone, I'm Sabina. I'm a project manager here at Phosphor Group Partnership. And I've been with the organization for about six years now. And I've had the pleasure of working on uh, projects where we looked at retrofitting vessels on the trainings, uh, basically making them cleaner. It was recently with Albi, which was formerly a diesel powered workboat, and it's now a uh, fully electric um, workboat. So we were planning on um, launching that uh, later this week. Um, I've also worked on smart systems for um, electric vehicle and speed management, and, um, and now I have a pleasure of working with Ross on this project. So, um, following from what Ross said about uh, the Waterloo, uh, about Waterloo Station, um, we commissioned transport experts, Steer and Intermodality, to produce these um, two reports, uh, the Express Rate Market Analysis, um, as well as the Waterloo Rate of Impact, impact Study. And I'll be giving you just a brief flavor of them. We will be publishing them later on this week, and you'll get to read about it in info for yourselves. So first of all, with the um, Express free, uh, free Market Analysis, and it basically looks to, um, it basically helps us understand the needs of the Korea Express Freight and Parcel Market, CEP Market short, for short, and, and what they need, what they need um, to deal with an expected growth of 7% per year for parcel deliveries. And, and, and let's see. So basically, um, it gives an overview of the CEP market in, in the UK. Um, it looks at um, what the market is comprised of in terms of small and large players operating within a mature and um, efficient network to provide efficient deliveries of parcels domestically and internationally. And it also looks at the impact of uh, increased e-commerce um, on the CE sector, as well as how the companies are structured and how they operate. And another thing that the report examines is the historical and potential growth of the CEP market, its market drivers, the risks, and the, and the opportunities for growth. Um, the graph that you see here um, shows that the CEP market uh, had a growth of 10% from 2014 until the pandemic when it had a 35% spike due to the increase in online shopping. And um, the report um, projects that by 2030, we will, we will be looking at about 7.6 billion parcel deliveries per year. Um, following further analysis, Steer also produced uh, two case studies demonstrating how real freight can provide solutions to the sector at Waterloo. Uh, the first case study looks at how existing operators function between the, between the Midlands and London over a 24 hour period, while the second um, case study looks at how um, existing passenger services could be used to bring freight into Waterloo Station. And then finally, at CRP, we will be working on the recommended um, next steps, which will include 
as understanding rolling stock solutions, um, commercial requirements, funding, and what exactly uh, the procurement and installation of a hub at water station will require. <laughs> Um, the next report is uh, the Waterloo Freight Hub Impact Study. And here, Intermodality sets the scene looking at London deliveries and transport of goods over the years before focusing on Waterloo Station as a potential solution for urban logistics. Um, following detailed research, the report gives a local framework for tools to improve logistics, as well as the challenges and, and opportunities faced um, at a hub at Waterloo Station. So um, the report the, the report surveyed um, seven commercial solutions to bursting out small logistics in urban areas, some of which you see here on this slide. Uh, these solutions serve as a basis for a series of scenarios that help determine how to address the challenges and opportunities referred to on the previous slide. Then the report hones in on Waterloo Station, highlighting its, correct, its characteristics, including its proximity to the capital, 200,000 square feet of a new space beneath the station, and the relatively easy access to the station and its platforms, as well as how it could be repurposed to also serve the logistics sector <laughs> in addition to passenger, passenger travel. Um, together, with the information um, from the previous slide, um, which showed uh, the various um, existing solutions to uh, to first and last mile logistics, um, the information has been pulled together to create eight scenarios exploring various iterations of road only freight, as well as road and rail service freight at Waterloo. So um, finally. Um, next steps for us will be addressing operational and commercial issues, um, especially making sure that any new implementations at the station doesn't adversely impact operations and is commercially attractive to the landlord and future tenants. Also, we and key stakeholders will be looking into how to integrate these new schemes into wider strategies, such as the London Plan and the Waterloo Station Master Plan. Um, as I said, uh, we will be sharing these reports with you later on this week. And yes, thank you. So now moving on to our panel discussion, I would like to ask our panelists, including Safina, to uh, head on over to the panel bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'll take this in a minute, but I just want to introduce you to one um, as well. Uh, so we, as I've mentioned, we've got a few pretty set questions uh, to get through, um, but once it's complete, we will open up to the audience um, and uh, those in the room as well. Um, so our panel of experts today includes Sophia Mataro, who you've just heard from. Um, so Sophia is project manager at CRP, also has managed the Clean Air Thames program as well, so is our River Freight expert on the panel as well, as knowing an awful lot about rail. Um, Paramasimi, so founder of EcoFleet, a zero emission large mile delivery company operating across London, particularly in West London. So uh, we've also got Dan Fredrickson as well, um, the uh, development lead for Express Freight at Network Rails of the Great British Railways Transitions team. Nick Gallup, who is the director at Intermodality, a specialist uh, transport and logistics consultancy, who's also been supporting our work, and Harshal Patel, who's a senior consultant at Steer, another transport consultant who has, been, who has also supported our work throughout with the Waterloo Freight Hub, all internal models and market reviews of the rail freight sector. Um, I'm going to ask the first question standing and then I'm just sitting on what's being answered. Um, so, uh, firstly, Nick, uh, I think we've got the first one. So, why is it important to have multiple freight operators and the sort of freight hub? Need the mic. Yes, <laughs> we will. Yeah. So, it seems to be Afternoon, everybody. Uh, the reason why it pays to have a community, uh, a diverse community of different providers of different sizes. And different functionality. 
if we've learned nothing from the last 20, 30 years from the other end of the rail supply chain, where a number of big recent distribution parks have been very successfully done by the private sector, strategic rail bring interchanges, that the reason they all, every single one of them, done so well in fostering new rail freight services is that they've got critical mass. They've got a community of freight users around them that finally has rail freight access literally plumbed into them, therefore making it that much easier for them to use rail because it's there and because it's operational and it's fit for purpose. So that brings it right the way back to the other end of that supply chain when you get into the city centres where we threw it all away, or our previous generations threw most of that away because we didn't think it was relevant to anything. So a lot of the London distribution depots that, that we have all called urban consolidation centres now or in recent years were all re-demolished and thrown away because we didn't think we needed them. The challenge of making rail freight work when it comes into an urban area is that, you know, 150 million parcels might sound like an easy job, but they're spread amongst so many different players that unless you get them all in a room or all on a big strategic distribution park, trying for a train operator to make all of that work by getting all that volume together is a huge challenge. But if they're all there as a community, uh, and these communities do collaborate, this is not cutthroat competition between operators, but unless you do that, it's going to make it that much harder for the train operators to get that critical mass to get the trains into the heat running because these flows will change from month to month, customer to customer. And if you've only got one person there, if they lose a major customer, rail could be lost as a result. So, so it's all about strengthening them. There is a second part of the question. So uh, how can we make this initiative worthwhile for operators? And would you recommend any sort of minimum lease, lease length requirements? The, the, the market response has been tremendous. So for those of you listening in or here, who responded to our pleas of support, um, thank you very much for all the contributions you did get from those wanting the entire site and the surrounding area of water leaves turned into a freight hub. Good luck with that. Um, to those that just said, actually, we just need a base for supplies to charging points um, because we're really struggling to find anywhere else locally. Um, so we've had a whole range of different organisations come back and all said the same thing, tell us more. But for them to be able to make the commitment to the site, they can't just come for a few weeks or a few days or a few hours. If they're going to make this work, then they're going to have to commit resource and get them working locally within the Waterloo framework to, to try and see how they get on. Um, that, that will take at least six months to do. So there is an opportunity, there are precedents for this in other parts of the railway estate where operators can come in and do things on a trial basis so that if after the number of weeks or months of operation it doesn't work for them one case, one time, of customers, um, they can move on uh, and then the space can be there for other people to use. It is not about poisoning the well for anything else that might come up with the master plan, but it is about giving operators enough of a chance to try before they buy. And then beyond that, based on how much they're prepared to invest themselves, that may have a bearing on the terms of the lease, because again, that's a principle that's used on other traditional rail websites across the network. So, so yes, I think we're six months minimum, but some very interesting precedents to draw on to make it happen there, aren't we? Thanks very much, Nick. Um, so next question might be good for Dan to answer. Um, so how do these Waterloo Freight Hub proposals fit in with the Waterloo Station Master Plan? So in um, 22, Network Rail and Lambeth commissioned uh, Grimshaw's tool to take a master plan review of the station and some of the surrounding areas about uh, improvements that could be made and um, that's due to be published over the coming months. Um, so I think um, the opportunity here for the freight hub uh, is a much more immediate one. Um, you know, the, we think it, it wouldn't take a huge amount to kind of get it going and, and establish some of those um, freight flows. It would definitely be a, a good intermediate uh, use. And then I think in the longer term, it's about working through what do the master plan proposals uh, mean for the longer term for the freight hub? Can they be uh, made to work um, together and sit side by side? What kind of footprint could the freight hub uh, have within the master plan development? And I think the, the other point to think about is that um, 
as the uh, master plan is implemented, there won't be one huge piece of work. It's going to be staged. It's going to be phased. So um, each one of those, there'll be the opportunity then to see well, what's the impact on any existing users that are there right now and any freight um, use that's established. So I think it's about working collaboratively um, with those involved with the master plan um, to see how they can best be delivered together. Brilliant. Um, thanks, Dan. Uh, so next one is for Safina. Just passing the microphone. Um, so what relevant lessons has CRP learned from setting up other freight hubs such as the Northwest and Western State? Thanks, Rex. So um, for us, it's definitely been an opportunity to build our expertise, things like um, process, legal legal requirements and planning. Um, it's been a chance to serve as a proof of concept for local authorities, some of whom are our partners, as well as to um, utilize underuse space in London where land is at a premium. Um, Barra, uh, this probably is going to be a good one for you. So, what features of vacant space across London are crucial to cargo bulk operators, such as, uh, I guess, the Waterloo space, but also spaces that you've worked with as well? Hi. Every square foot uh, of London counts and it's valuable. So the fact that there is a significant uh, undercroft space at Waterloo Station is a huge gain for our city. And uh, having a great master plan will make great use of this space and will bring uh, and promote railway uh, deliveries and how sustainable they can be. Um, that's a really wonderful thing that can happen from this trial. Um, to set up a hub is not that complicated. It's easy. Uh, it, the space requirements are not huge, but it needs to have the obvious, such as space for uh, bike charging, battery charging, good lighting, um, ease of access into and out of the hub, um, ergonomic equipment for loading and unloading on the platform. Um, it needs to have um, a good uh, security in terms of roller shutters so that operators can have their insurance in place, uh, as well as safety for their loan workers if they're working a shift pattern, which is late in the evening. Um, and it also, the space also needs to be somewhat regulated in terms of parking outside of the hub by other vehicles so that it doesn't delay delivery times by being too uh, crowded there. Also, waiting bays just outside the hub where, you know, vans and lorries might come to pick up their goods. And um, if the train is late, then they will be taking up the uh, loading base for a long time. So having um, good technology and real time uh, train delivery timetables is really important to operate at um, a rail uh, station. Um, also, the space needs to be shared amongst all other cargo bike uh, companies that are going to be collaborating. So it needs to be a collaborative space which fosters and promotes a good um, friendship and collaboration uh, in that sense. Um, And I guess another one that might be good for you to answer as well is how could the Waterloo Freight Hub be made truly multimodal, so include rail, road, and river? Um, I know you've alluded to some of that there, but do you have any other thoughts? Yeah. The, I think the master plan is critical, uh, and it needs to uh, think of road, rail, and the piers, which are close by, as you mentioned, St. George's uh, 
um, Bankside and uh, Festival Pier are all close by, so that's a tremendous bonus. And in the mix should be improved um, bike lanes to pr promote uh, the cycle deliveries, but also um, they should be made possibly slightly wider in that um, today we have wider bikes, different types of bikes, um, so a really robust uh, bike infrastructure week. Um, so, Harshal, so from the research that you've done, why do we, why do you feel like a, a trial phase at the start of this water frame hub process would be a good idea? I think it can, as we've been setting out, I think they've already demonstrated some of the benefits, especially from an operator perspective, trying to look towards seeing what this space can do for them. I think from their perspective, I think they would be much appreciated at trial period because it's really difficult for them to understand how they will use the space without them physically being there. I think from a wider uh, from a wider perspective of the great logistics sector, I think having one per have, seeing a trial there would encourage more and more people to 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 potentially be interested in this sort of um, in this sort of activity. I think a lot of the as we all know the the freight and logistics sector is fairly much freight based at the moment, and I think one of the bigger tra bigger challenges that we are seeing is getting them to move away from what they do currently and the way they're all operating is on low margins for the focused on day to day business. I think without a trial to incentivize them to try something different, I think it's very hard for them to be motivated to do something different, even though the benefits might be there. Um, and then looking at it from, from other perspectives, from the, the station asset management team, for example, understanding how, how using a station that's predominantly been geared towards passenger certain passengers is all of a sudden now also being used to a complete break. That interface between our freight operations may interact with passenger operations. And this is something that will be a challenge, especially as we if, if, once we start looking in towards looking at a rail fed, rail fed trial, but even understanding some of the security and safety, how that how that will be all used by starting with a with a road fed trial is something that we can just understand much more easily than just jumping into it without. Brilliant. And I guess short and long term, what benefits do you think will stem from this project? Well, there's a there's a there's a long list of benefits that we've again looked at it from multiple stakeholders' perspectives. And again, I think a report that we wrote um, over the last year really summarizes a lot of the benefits that I think well our initial commission and we are the initial commission working with um, DEFA and in that kind of world is focused on sort of improving air quality in London and understanding how making freight zero emission and making sustainable and what the impacts of that would be. And I think that's still one of the big, a, a lot of it stems from how many polluting vehicles you can get off the road. And I think we've seen evidence over the last couple of years with, with other micro freight trials. But just walking around, just walking here from my office in Waterloo, just seeing the number of car key cargo bikes that now service some of the local businesses and areas in, in this part of London. It, 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 there's been enough evidence to show that this sort of last integrating, um, having a consolidation centre and having last mass solutions that are sustainable do work in the context of central London in terms of driving around vans, tram service. Lots of different locations is, is not very efficient. Um, okay. So again, having a half the size of Waterloo that can service the e-bikes that are required to take over that load and have a sustainable, and this is without talking about sustainable ground bed input, mm -hmm. which again, that's a whole different scale of environmental benefit that we're talking about. Just to, I'm talking about from a local air quality perspective, I think we can go a long way towards Essentially, completely decolonizing our our last mile delivery which is those. and then again shifting to to if if and when we get to a point where we can bring rail freight directly into what to do, the number of HGVs you, you can save on doing those sort of long haul trips between the Midlands and London. I think from a national perspective, the decolonization, uh, the generally sort of needing that sort of innovation, the amount 
the amount of time it would take for HGV to fully decarbonize, I think. We're getting to a point where e e e e vans, we're getting electric vans, but to get electric 20 ton HGVs, I think we're still decades away from that. So again, rail, we can have electric rail. We've got we've got electrified. Thank you, Paul, for those there. Thanks, Harshal. Um, so, Vera, um, just touching on a couple of the benefits there, but particularly thinking about the local community, how will local communities be impacted by the freight hub, do you think? I think the advantages will be huge in that um, there will be commercial gain in business as well as job employments, uh, local job employments, which um, we're all encouraged to do to hire locally. Um, also, I think um, that um, uh, having um, a robust uh, welfare facilities uh, will make the community feel a little bit more uh, cohesive um, where operators and residents can mix. So that's important. And I think um, it would be huge to uh, study and talk to locals in order to get their very valuable input because this is their community and they know it best. So I think that study uh, would be very valuable. Um, and the fact that this is going to be a trial before it gets implemented, I think that's also very valuable in this community. At least uh, we can prevent errors from happening. Great. Um, thanks, Russ. So, um, Dan, a uh, more technical question here. So. Will planning permission be needed for the water freight hub? Um, I'll do my best on a um, technical um, So the um, network rail has certain permitted development rights for its estate. If there's an established um, link to rail, then it, it, uh, as long as the um, as long as changes are not being made outside of the station itself, then there's there's certain permitted developments that it can make. Um, where it's, there's a, a challenge is um, if there's not a direct link to rail and there's more work to be done. I think some of the advantages are with the, the studies that have just been concluded that, that are going to be shared. Um, we're able to talk, talk in much more detail about the type of operation that it's going to be and what the likely impacts are of that. So there's work to be done on uh, on the level of sort of, um, planning requires, um, but you know within the within the um, the, uh, the railway itself and the and the rail estate, then uh, there's, there's quite a lot of flexibility as long as um, you know the, the safety and security considerations are are, are met. Um, thanks, Dan. So, Nick, from the research you've been doing as well, do you think? Public subsidies uh, will be required to get this water freight hub started. How much do you think it will cost? Um, yeah, the, the, there's always a danger that as soon as you, you mention subsidy, it's like, oh, fantastic, because I could have done it without it. Um, if you don't and say this is going to be a straight commercial, why you after it or not, then that's a better starting point, I would argue. You know, we, we, we have moved some way away from a world where if you mention rail freight, usually three sentences later, you'd be asking about a grant somewhere in there to fund this startup, to fund this operation. Um, and given how long it's been since the, the industry was privatised, and the one bit of the industry actually was privatised in the main, that um, I think the operators and the, the customer base has got used to uh, being pulled away from it, so to speak, in terms of funding, grant funding. You know, the Bath Transport doesn't fund capital rail freight projects anymore. They're doing Scotland and Wales, but but in England, I think the feeling was, look, you know, we've put enough money into setting all of this up. You should be able to find your way now. And then we've got to a point where the industry is mature enough that some of the biggest names that are using rail at the moment are not doing it necessarily to undercut road haulage. They're doing it because it's far more reliable, um, first and foremost, not because it shaves them a few penny off each roll cage. Um, and they're doing it for environmental social governance reasons as well, but fundamentally it's operational resilience one, everything else two. 
And I think as far as the Waterloo project goes, yes, it would be, it would be very tempting and probably too easy to set it up as something that's just packed full of grants. And as soon as the grant funding drops off, because it always does, that everything then drops off with it. So I think from the, the engagement we've had, there are enough people who are struggling to find floor space in central London because, as Farrah said, it's such a premium, or because we've turned it all over to other things. But when something like this comes along, it's it's not that often in central London that 200,000 square feet comes up with multi-mode connectivity. That is extremely rare. And that's reflected in the interest that we've had from the commercial market from people who know what floor space costs in this neck of the woods. Um, and, you, and you certainly won't find it at that kind of scale at those sort of rates. So, so thus far, no one said, well, yeah, we'll do it, but give us a grant if I think about it. It's more about how much space we've got, because that, that, that reflects, I'm afraid, our society. We want everything yesterday. We want to press a button on our phone and hours later or minutes later. Sorry, I'm in London now, so minutes later, <laughs> uh, we expect it to be delivered. Um, and because of that, you've got to get that product close to the customer so you can achieve that. And to do that, adds more cost into the supply chain. Yes, it does. And we're all paying for that. But it does give the commercial market more of an opportunity to go, OK, the demand's there and the business case is there. The only thing we're missing is the floor space, the accessibility. And Warsaw kind of ticks a huge number of boxes to people. So this would be more about, I would argue, starting it at a commercial proposition, yes, there is an opportunity to try before you buy, given the space isn't earning anybody anything at the moment. Um, so the ability for it to at least start earning some revenue for its landlords um, and some of the other tenants would be no bad thing. But once you've got people in there and confirming that the tolls are ready about what this means to them operationally, back to the point about you might be paying premium, but there's a good reason for that, then there's an opportunity for this to stand on its feet the way all the other tenants under that roof stand on their feet at the moment. So that's not to say there isn't a role for the public sector, there isn't a role for interventions, because there is, because we wouldn't all be here in this room if it wasn't for that unless we could again. But going forward, no, this is not about going for a massive grant to subsidise operations that merely duplicate or interfere with the supply chain. It's about providing the catalyst and the spark that has already drawn various people through who want to do it commercially. So it's a case of Let's go forward on that basis now. Thanks, thank you. Um, Safina, um, how do you think these Waterloo Freight Hub proposals will be affected by a change of mayor or perhaps a change of government? Shouldn't. Um, so the, the project itself is a political, which means that um, it should be immune to any changes in in leadership, whether it's at the national or at the local level. Um, and additionally, I think the project ticks uh, various pop boxes we could appeal to um, most politicians. It addresses air quality, it um, supports uh, an e-commerce economy, and it's innovative. innovative. So far, we've had really promising conversations. And going forward, we will keep collaborate, collaborating with key stakeholders and leaders to make sure that the project keeps progressing. Thanks, Sophia. And Dan, could you outline any timelines in terms of process from now on uh, and when it's all likely to happen? Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll do my best to, to look into the crystal ball. Um, so we've already um, started some of the discussions about how we could uh, operate this case with a with a trial, trying to outline some of the challenges of, a, of running it as a road fed operation. Um, but we, we're hoping that we can get something uh, on that basis um, through in the in the new year. Uh, but there are still some some things to work through on that. Um, in terms of rail. Um, there are um, th there are some slightly more significant um, sort of barriers to overcome. So we've done a lot of the groundwork. We've been looking about how you could uh, timetable services into Waterloo. What's the what's the availability of the required platforms that have the direct access into the Undercroft space? Um, and some of those key like foundational questions we've we've started to answer those those already. Um, there is um, some more work to be done on um, 
the type of uh, rail rolling stock that's capable of running into uh, Waterloo Station? Uh, are there some interim solutions that could use existing technology um, to, to run some services? So there's, there's those kind of things that we're asking we'll come up with the answers, um, but it's going to take some uh, further collaboration with operators in that in that sector. Um, but you know the the, the timetabling and the and the freight uh, the the rail freight side of things tends to have a slightly longer lead time. So you know we'd be talking um, you know, closer to uh, twelve months, eighteen months that that kind of uh, duration. Um, so I think that there are a number of freight operating companies who are very interested in the in the express freight market. Uh, but it, it is an emerging and slightly immature sector. But we've seen some great progress made uh, in the last few months. You know, we've got a, a commercial operation now be, between Birmingham International and Moss End, so five nights a week running actual commercial traffic on a converted passenger train. So there, there are people out there delivering this stuff successfully day in, day out. Um, so we want to keep working with these partners to see, you know, what can we do at, at Waterloo you know, involving Fox and and uh, last mile logistics companies. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, I guess the final preset question is probably for me to Sophia. Of can you tell everyone how they can find out more before we open up to the audience? Um, so, as I mentioned during my presentation, we will be sharing these two reports later on this week. There are other reports available on our website covering um, freight in, in its various forms. Um, I'm also open to questions. Feel free to contact me, contact Ross, contact any of us really. At CRP, uh, we're always happy to help. Great. Um, we have around 10, 15 minutes for audience questions. I would say 10 minutes. Um, does anyone want to start? Suzanne is going to go wandering with the mic. Um, so does anyone have any questions here? Do we have any online? I have got one from. Thank you. Um, David Kana from Central London Freight Policy Partnership. I'll let that hand today. Um, the, this is very focused on express freight, so parcels, and I can see why this works for parcels. But what proportion of freight that comes into central London, if you exclude construction logistics stuff, is actually parcel freight? So how big a bit of the pie can programs like this and the Paddington Hub and the new one that British Land are putting, putting in the city, what proportion is this going to work for? Harshly, is that something that might have come across in the field research and Mick. Yeah. Mick has been on that. Yeah. Believe me, my gift. I think, as you said, across the UK, I think the express well, freight market sector, in, in comparison to all freight goods, is a small proportion. It's a growing proportion, but it's a small proportion. The traditional sort of freight, the intermodal freight, Still makes a large, makes a significantly large proportion, as does construction material, as you reference, and aggregate and coal and that sort of thing. It's still, it's still present on a national level as well. Specifically looking at London, um, again, I'll go you on sort of to see the past market is X percent of the total amount of things that going to London, but based on the demographics and the the make up of sectoral London, uh, I'll just limit the a relatively big proportion um, outside of construction, as you said, I can't think of that in a big, big freight loads that would be directly shipped to central London. Yeah, there you go. And, and just to add to that thing, we heard at the, the start, you know, 450 million becomes a billion before you know it in terms of parcels. Um, so, so from a long perspective, yes, it's huge. And again, let's just remember that it's not just parcels in the sense of things that we all have around us and other retailers are of anymore. Um, it, it's about the fact that once you've established a supply chain that can deliver anything on a pallet or a roll package or an individual parcel into, into, into a central area and not have to put in a shipping container, then you have to lift off as they've tried to do in Paris. 
we got to mention small or detail. Um, is the so it would be, but um, but there is that point that if you don't have to bring it into central London and try and create like the gate like you with big container cranes and stuff, it's it's about you load the trains the way you load a truck and you unload them when you unload a truck, so you don't bring it into also and ask someone where nearest crane is. You actually just cross dock it between the vehicles as you would do in a traditional parcel pump. And once you've established that, part of the reason we put M and S up on on the case that is in the report is that in 2007 they came to the industry to say some of our best performing stores, retail stores, are on stations. And we bring all of that in in roll cages, dollies as they call them, um, and our di distribution centres are around the M25. And most of them are pretty close to railhead. So how do we do it? And it's a question they're still asking. And, and other retailers have now come in and said, and have actually tried into places like Houston as well in, in recent months actually, because they're all asking the same question. If you can if you can move a parcel, it can't be that much more difficult to move a roll cage. And if you can move a roll cage, you can move the pallet. And if you can do all of that, then where's the floor space that makes it all happen? So so it's a it's a parcel to, to catch a whale if you excuse the tangle. Um, there you yeah, I would I would echo that. I think there's there's more types of freight that, that would be uh, appropriate for this this kind of space and and that kind of um, that rail uh, to road interchange, you know, the convenience format supermarket would be um, something that would um, potentially quite readily adopt this. There's a lot of uh, trolleys being used in, in that uh, logistics supply chain, so it, it's more about how the goods are moved about than than what's sort of in the on the pallets or in the uh, roll cage. Okay, thanks. Just as a follow-up to that, I, I used to run a rail connected warehouse at Eastern that shipped bottled water from Southern France. So I understand the logistics of the rail connected supply chain. The um, most retailers and other people who ship dollies into central London have built their supply chains around, we're going to do it without rail. Um, so we've got them, as you say, around the M25 in lots of different places around the M25, and then we ship them on a truck, which could be an electric truck in the future, and I've seen a few, into central London to a store. If you're going to then switch to rail, you've then got to get it from that distribution centre to a rail connected hub out on the M25, into Waterloo, and then onto another low carbon vehicle to shift it to your destination store, and that's handling it twice. And we say cross docking is easy, but it's not cheap. Um, it's not cheap than putting in the warehouse and taking out the it's still it's still not free. How much work have you done around what would be the supply, the end-to-end -end supply chain cost once you move away from parcels which you can afford it to larger roll cages and so on? I'll, I'll start and I think after one come in and just want to again the, the, the head of primary for Sainsbury's when we when we pulled them into Houston at two in the morning a decade ago, which again CRP had a role in unless we begin. The head of primary said, um, you're likely as head of us on because, because you've just moved our stuff from our national distribution centre in the Midlands straight through to here in 45 minutes. Why are we bothering regional distribution centres? So it's so so yes, you're right. The, 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 the traditional mindset would be, oh, this is like one of those urban consolidation centres. It's just yet another name, another overhead, another set of costs. It doesn't actually add anything apart from cost and, and a flag and a, this was funded by. The, where the retailers are coming from, and, and again, some of this has been driven by the carriers saying we don't have time anymore to go to this Miggins, to the local depot, to the hub, queue for a slot at the hub in Atherston or wherever. And, and by the time by the time we've got through there, resorted it and taken it out to the hub in Glasgow and got it to Mr Miggins, they either haven't made the sale because it takes too long or they decide not to do it again. So, so that, that whole, because we all want everything yesterday, we, I mean, crikey, for those who remember the next directory when that first came out, all those hundreds of years ago, where you were told in no uncertain terms, 28 days, and you went, okay, get the shirt in 28 days, then put this one in the wash. Um, <laughs> now, because if we wait more than 28 minutes, my kids start getting the vapors. The, 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 it's all about speed and velocity in the spy chain. So, so it is not about adding more points into the network. This would be not necessarily shipping it from the Midlands down to a DC at Thatcham and then docking, cross docking there, onto a train, cross docking, into London, cross docking, down to the customer going, how long's it taken? This is about actually 
cutting out for part of the supply chain. This is not a universal panacea, but for the part of the supply chain that, that wants to cut down on stock holding, that wants to increase its velocity in the supply chain, improve the same day offer that they're all chasing. Uh, and they know they can't do it by road. This is where rail has a particularly good advantage. That for those people who go, I want to go to NDC in the Midlands, that's logistics dead, straight through to station, cross stop there, but then goes off final mile. So, so it's it's about this this Simon Watts saying poll me said from Sainsbury's that night. This is light years ahead of how they do it at the moment, but that's not to say they can't change. But if nothing happens here, they'll stick with it because they've got more alternative. Can I um, add a supplement? My name is Chris Thurman. Um, I'm the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. I head up the curbside, uh, curbside uh, activity. Uh, and on top of that, I uh, sit on the new Cotton Guard Market uh, Traffic Advisory Committee. So I'm fairly close to hand in the slot. Um, and I'm in the food sector. Now, adding on to the comments you've just made, how are you going to be able to cope with the food standards, food, food safety and maintenance, cold and chilled, particularly for that sort of traffic like you know, dairy products, all the stuff that we know and love and buy from our convenience and major superstores in London. Can you cope with that? And on the basis that it's likely to work on a 24 hour, seven day a week basis. Yeah. Um, Right. But first off, the services are already running, or the, the, the framework of operations that have already been set up have been running for about a decade now, so it's gone various London stations. Started with medical, so started with lab tests, organs, all sorts of things that the travelling public obviously know nothing about because they're never stored in any passenger uh, open space with a passenger. They're always in secure space, so it's like belly hold on airlines. Now that whole infrastructure has gone through all the hoops about terrorism, security, biohazard, and all the rest of it. So the reason the reason labs have been using, particularly during COVID, the reason so many test results got to the labs so much quicker than by road is because the labs sent them by train now, 25 miles an hour. So so everything from and, and even those that remember this because only a few years back, the um the then MD of Great Western standing rather awkwardly with a live lobster in his hands on Paddington Station, thinking this thing's gonna bite him and it did. Um, hmm. Because their live seafood has been moved up from Cornwall. That was still alive when he got there. Um, so, so in terms of can rail deal with with food and perishables? Yes. The, the mechanisms, the agreements, the, the infrastructure, the protocols are all there. But again, it's no surprise that Tesco, for example, started their journey into five train today with Ambien. With Ambien, slow moving, no big risk. Let's just get it on the rail. The fact that they're now moving across to moving into chilled, moving into frozen, and that they're bringing their fresh, they are fresh, yeah, their fresh fruit up from Spain, refrigerated containers by rail, um, is because, you know, life has moved on. Um, so, so there is that if the railway is bad at anything, it's telling people it does really well, right? which is why part of this exercise is a lot of people go, oh, we did that, because we never tell them. So probably a lot of us in the logistics world got pretty by the railways failing, failing to do it. I think, I think this kind of operation would be likely to start with ambience. Um, I think that would be um, yeah. the, the customers and the and the operators you know, getting used to that supply chain, getting throwing confidence in that supply chain and the, and the timeliness of deliveries and, and all of those things. Um, <coughs> the current uh, way of using kind of converted passenger stock to do this stuff it, you know, it doesn't, it can't deal with uh, with uh, chilled and frozen at the moment. That's not to say that you know, the technological uh, installations and either retrofit or purpose built would be able to cope with that kind of um, goods in, in future. So I think they're just mentioning that Euro stuff. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, we can. So, so the, the space underneath uh, Waterloo, it it still has some of the uh, infrastructure from when Eurostar handled um, chilled goods uh, within that space. We haven't kicked the tires on it to see if it if it still works, but it, you know, a lot of that uh, tech is in is in that space, and, and it has been used for that in the past. So, yeah, very helpful. Thank you.
Yeah, I think we can, yeah, we can take one more question very quickly. Thank you. Um, Phil Smart from the Rail Freight Group. Uh, we've heard that this is uh, a wonderful thing for uh, the people who want everything yesterday, but the people who want everything yesterday also want to return it tomorrow if it's the wrong size, colour or is faulty. <laughs> um, so how is this going to work um, on the collection side of things? Because it, it seems this one of the problems that freight always has is that of return loads, and this model seems to lend itself to that possibility. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think the, re the return loads, it, it's a, uh, it would certainly be a useful sort of backfill of, of the train from the, the previous day's um, deliveries. Um, it does present additional challenges from making sure that the chain of custody is, is kept secure. So um, I don't think it would be insurmountable by any means, but it does introduce, you know, an extra layer of, of Sort of protection of, a, of the rail system that you know the, the um, safety and security of the of the traveling public is paramount and also those businesses who are using this kind of service you know they don't want to see anything walk off either so it's it's beneficial to both parties to make sure that those are secure areas but certainly you know, um, additional security protocols would have to be in place if ever there's a an interaction of sort of public um, to the system of logistics. Thanks, Dan. Um, I think we are now at the end of the panel discussion, but thanks very much for all the questions and thanks to those, uh, to everyone that's answered questions throughout as well and for joining us. Um, probably do a round of applause for the panel. So um, I have put uh, the contact details of all of our panelists and my own contact details on the screen. So please do reach out to us if you've got any questions. Um, most of us should be around afterwards as well. So if you do want to talk to us, please do go ahead. Um, sure, uh, we could book out the room for another day for Nick to talk about. Uh, <laughs> <so>. um, uh, <laughs> And so also if you've uh, enjoyed this event, um, then there is another one around the corner as well. So our next CLP conversations will focus on transport equity on Wednesday, the 29th of November from 4 till 5 p.m. So please do sign up. This is also a hybrid session um, as well. It's uh, encouraging in-person in attendance with uh, people coming online as well. Um, so that will be with the Centre for London, Our Bike and the University of Westminster's active traveling company as well um but yeah that's it everyone so thanks for all of you that have uh, decided to join today in the room and online it's much appreciated and um, we'll send out some follow-up resources over the next uh couple of days as well um, we've got coffee biscuits juice water and even fruit this time and uh, so uh, and please do network go ahead and, and uh enjoy yourselves for the next hour so, so yeah thanks all Thank <clears throat>